Hi! If you've been keeping along with our Dig Deeper series, you'll know that in episode 60, we discussed how our 1608 ditch is cut by our 16 teens well. I mentioned how talking about the ditch was going to have to be a whole nother video because there's so much to discuss, and this is that video. We're also joined by Director of Archaeology David Givens to talk about this ditch and how it changes our understanding of Jamestown. I'm down here in the 1617 well. I'm standing on the surface of what we believe to be the 1617 well, and I'm intentionally using that term, we believe, because that's most of the time in historical archaeology, that's what you start off with. You start off with a, a theory, and uh, that theory is based on some evidence, and then you work towards better information. And overall, that is what historical archaeology is. It's the reconciliation between what we find in the ground, like this clear builder's trench and well, and then you determine more information through digging and then start looking at the historic records. Today, what is apropos to what we're talking about are maps. So one of the things Europeans did when they came over to the New World was to map out the resources. And that was a specific direction given to John Smith, was to search out uh, the native population, numbers of population, food, resources, and things like that. So we have a couple maps that are appropriate to talk about today, specifically within the find that we're about to talk about. And that's, uh, firstly, John Smith's map. It's been referred to in the past as the Zuniga map. And that's because the ambassador, the Spanish ambassador, Pedro de Zuniega, had acquired Smith's map, either copied it or taken the original, uh, along with a map of our sister colony. So a lot of Americans don't know that we had a contemporary sister colony, the Popham colony in Maine. Uh, that colony didn't make it um, through another year. Uh, they packed up and left, and the map, that was made of that colony is very detailed. And um, both that map, which is referred to as the Hunt map, and the Smith map ended up in the archives in Valladolid and, and Simancas and were found by a, an Amer a, wor a gentleman working for the American ambassador at the turn of the century. And he gave those to uh, a researcher named Alexander Brown. Now, what's so important about these different maps is they comment about what we found recently archaeologically in the ground. Now, particularly with the Smith map, there's a couple features on the map, one of which is that at each corner of the triangle there are bulwarks, which are described, and in the center of the map, it looks like an X marks the spot, and we now know through archaeology that that's the location of the 1608 church. It's a Maltese cross. And then on the north part of the fort icon, the James Fort icon, is what everyone, historians and archaeologists, thought was a flag. The other map uh, that was recorded of Jamestown, it was done by a gentleman named Tyndall. And that map was uh, done for the king's son and ended up in archives. Uh, that map shows a triangular fortification with bulwarks, but no flag coming off the north end uh, as the Zuniga map or John Smith's map shows. The Tyndall map went back a little bit earlier in April and the Smith map goes back in June, on June 2nd actually. And the current find or what we think is going on here at Jamestown is we may have found the flag feature. Now that flag feature this is where we get into the we believe statement. That flag feature may be a garden. And the reason that we have that supposition or that theory is because our sister colony in Maine, the Popham colony, has a similar feature and it's listed as a garden. Now one of our former curators had fomented this, had thought about it as the case 
many, many years ago, and she was actually the first person we called um, when we when we discovered the uh, ditch that Natalie was referring to, which is in front of me now. Um, but all of this is an absolute excellent example of why you dig, why you continue the research. And this newfound feature, along with others that will be future Dig Deeper episodes, are defining a town that increases the size of James Fort by two-thirds. In other words, behind me, the fortification here is an acre and a half, and there's over three to four acres of newfound Jamestown. So we've gone from James Fort out here to Jamestown. Now how we found this feature was through ground penetrating radar. So a couple of our staff members in 2019, I asked them to run a radar survey across the field, the north field, uh, north field of James Fort. And my principal interest was to look at the ability for ground penetrating radar to see subsurface water conditions as we were having issues with a, a marsh and, and increasingly a growing marsh behind uh, or north of James Fort. And my theory was that because water in the soil changes the capacitance or the dielectric of soils, that would show up on the radar and it did. However, there were a number of exciting features that we found or landscape based features that we found in the process of that. So there is the Great Road is in the image uh, there are lot lines over the centuries, and that helps us figure out landscape, who owns what property over time, and you can build back the 17th century. But also on the image, emanating from the north bulwark here, out in the field and then across, was a very ephemeral ditch-like ditch feature. So looking at that radar imagery and parsing it out, it was very clear that this was a approximately six foot wide and maybe as much deep uh, ditch. Um, now, radar doesn't tell you what time period it is, and so that was left up to the excavations. But it was very clear that it was a significant wide and deep feature that went out into the field. Now, last year with the University of Virginia Field School, we decided to dig down to that feature. And what was very exciting to the team is that all the early, early features, so within the first three years of James Fort, have a similar fill structure in which they're mixed clay of the soil that's here before the English arrived. So that was the first sign. Now, it was a little problematic in that when we looked at the soil, there wasn't a single historic artifact um, within, within the fill out in the field. And the question could be, what time period is it? Where, you know, could it be Virginia Indian? There are very similar structures found at Werewakomoko, the Powhatan seat of power. Um, and so one of the ways that we got through that and to look at the profile of this was to take out the area I'm standing. That's why we're so deep down in here. And I'm standing at the bottom of the Confederate moat so there was a moat around our Fort Pocahontas, which was built in 1861, first started by the landowner and later uh, formerly trained engineers. But they dug a 18, 20 foot wide moat, six feet deep around the fort. And in the process, they cut through our putative ditch here. And so with the UVA Field School and with our annual kids camp, we actually excavated out the, the moat that was here to look at our profile. And to that end, we were very su successful as well. And what we ended up seeing was a six foot wide and five foot deep military trench. Now the Morphology of the ditch is what suggests that it's military related and that it is flat bottomed. And so with, with uh, military trenching or, or works, outworks like this that are defensive, almost universally they're military if they're flat bottomed. So if you look at the East Bulwark and our publications of the trenches there, they're U-shaped because they function differently. This would actually have people walking in it, similar to trenches maybe in the Ukraine today. Um, the life of the feature in the profile 
was very evident. There was a living surface in the bottom, charcoal rich, artifact rich. And then there was a series of wash lenses, many, many wash lenses. And that would suggest abandonment. And then it was filled in heavily with the clay that appears to have been dug out of it. So right now, our supposition or our we believe statement is that there was some kind of mound or earthwork on the leeward side of this feature. Now, I was still a little nervous until we dug into this section here in front of me because we still hadn't found any historic artifacts. But once we took that section out, we found things like bottle glass, lead, brass, piece of a broken pulley it looks like, uh, sheet metal, and things like that. So we knew this was an historic feature. Now, going back to our maps, John Smith's map goes back in June. Tyndall's map is in April. What time would you plant a garden feature in Virginia? It'd be about this time in May. It's just starting to warm up probably before then. Now, this feature in this entire town is reflective in a larger sense, not only the archaeology and the history coalescing, but also the larger issues of leadership here and what's happening in that transitional period between the original president, Edward Mariah Wingfield, subsequent Mr. Ratcliffe, and then Mr. Smith, taking more of a leadership role within the colony. Now, originally, the Virginia Company directives were for them not to plant significant gardens because then the Indians would know they were here to stay. And when Wingfield, who's a very much following the rule books, is imprisoned on the discovery and sent back to England, Smith and First Radcliffe and then Smith take a more active role in transforming what's going on the, what's going on on the ground here, whereas the leadership's back in London, here they're having to deal with Virginia Indians, the rough environment and things like that. And likely, Smith and others saw the need to transform the landscape into a significant amount of food to feed the colony. Additionally, in 1608 and in 9, you see the, an influx of colonists that were being brought over in subsequent resupplies that would culminate in 16, that would culminate in 1609 in the arrival of those who weren't shipwrecked on Bermuda. So almost 300 people arrive here with starving mouths, little supplies, no leadership, and the records tell us that they ate through seven acres of corn in three days. Now all of this would lead to the starving time winter of 1609 and 10 in which John Smith, their ambassador to the, the Powhatan had to leave, the Senecomicans had to leave, he had a powder burn. You had the worst drought in 770 years. They resort to violence with the Virginia Indians and they're sequestered here, in, eventually inside James Fort and after that winter, that tough winter of cannibalism, other horrifying events, they would erase this, what we believe to be a town. Now we have a lot more information. The archeology span and the radars providing us additional information. There appears to be significant structural elements going to the east and that comments on the emerging townscape that's fort to town. Smith in 1608 says there are 40 to 50 houses in that town and then subsequently says 50 to 60. There has never been room for that many houses in the triangle, the acre and a half triangle. And so we're wondering if this north field holds the evidence for that that town and certainly reflects on that influx of population and where they were all living. Now this summer, with the University of Virginia Field School, our intention is to open more squares out in the field at the far end so we can see where our flag-shaped feature is going, more where it turns, and more out in the field where we think these, these houses are. 
So I'm going to turn it back over to Natalie to tell you a little bit more about the ditch and some of the artifacts. But stay tuned. It's a very exciting time in James Fort's history, in which it seems as though Jamestown just doubled itself in size. The entire reason that we came over to this excavation site was to expose this ditch profile. Once we exposed the profile, uh, we had what we wanted, but we also realized that in order to dig the well, we had to construct a giant well ring and a deck that would ultimately cover up this ditch. So we've decided to excavate it back all the way to the wall, starting with this one foot section. As you can see behind me, there's not just one episode of filling in this ditch, but there are many different episodes which correspond to layers in this ditch. And we've marked them out, not just so that we the archaeologists are able to see, but so that you all are able to see at home all the different layers that filled in this ditch. We take each layer out separately because we can understand the life of this ditch better by looking at all the artifacts and the differences and similarities in each of these layers. So up top, there is a clay cap uh, that is large and has a visible rock in it. In the middle, there are alternating bands of dark brown soil, light sandy wash, and bits of orange clay. And at the very bottom, there is a heavy charcoal and daub deposit. Daub is unfired clay that is used structurally in buildings, but the reason that it's fired here is that it was exposed to heat, much like when you put uh, clay into a kiln to be fired to be used as a brick. This first layer in our 1608 ditch tells us that not only is there a mud and stud structure that is outside of James Fort, it's somewhere nearby. The first section of the ditch that we took out was only about a foot back, and this was to see how the layers were interacting with each other and how they changed as we took it back. However, the second section needed to excavate the entirety of the ditch that we had in our units so that the well deck construction wouldn't interfere or damage anything that was in the ditch. So the next section we took out was all the way back to the northernmost wall. So. Now we are almost done with our excavations of the ditch in this area, and we have some really important discoveries we've made along the way. In the first section, it appeared that the layers of the ditch reached across the entire width. So it appeared that it had been dug once and then filled in over time, and that was it. Now, in this second section, we can actually see that there is a portion of the ditch that had been re-dug. As far as the layers go, starting at the top, you have two different intentional clay deposits. These are probably associated with Lord Delaware's arrival in 1610, cleaning up inside and outside of the fort. Underneath that, we have the wash layers that we saw further to the south when we were taking out our initial section, although they have narrowed significantly. You can tell that this ditch has been re-dug by looking at the shape of the layers and then also the entire shape of the profile on the left and right side. You can see that there are several flat layers at the bottom that look like they've been cut through by this darker soil. These flat layers over here on the right, or excuse me, on the left, and these two over here are indicative of the first iteration of the ditch. It was very flat bottomed and it included this deeper channel here towards the center. It got cut through later on, and the edge of the ditch actually moved a little bit to the east, and it actually got wider on the other side as well. This is the edge of the initial ditch, and this is the edge of the secondary ditch. The first iteration of the ditch was very flat bottomed, and it had this deeper channel. So the change in shape and the redigging event that this ditch experienced is possibly related to a military ditch. The first deposit in the center of the ditch over here in our first section and as we took it back all seem to be a part of the initial ditch as there is charcoal fill in the bottom of the channel over here and also off to the sides. What's interesting is that these subsoil shelves and this deeper channel stopped right at the edge of these two shelves. That is interesting just because the fill that is inside of the trench continues out even though the shelf and the trench itself stops. So all the charcoal and daub that was present throughout the entire bottom portion of the ditch all the way back 
is a part of this first ditch and its flat-bottomed iteration. As far as artifacts in this ditch, we continue to see a similar pattern of very little uh, European or English artifacts and a higher density of Native American ceramics. There were also two important artifacts that we know are definitely European, one of which being the small shard of glass that was sticking out of the wall before we dug back this entire section. And there was also a very large, very thin um, piece of iron that was in the very bottom of the ditch situated in the charcoal layer. As of right now, we're not sure what it is, but we've done some x-rays to figure out what it is. So that finishes off the ditch excavation in this area. However, we will continue to trace this ditch around the landscape in front of James Fort and take out sections of it as we go along. Thanks for watching.